Shabtai should be known to every Jew. He really should be in Jewish history something unique and huge because more than half the Jews of the world thought he was the Messiah. And um, they did an incredibly stupid, stupid things in the days of redemption. Uh, this was in the uh, 16, um, 1660s uh, when he declared that he was the Messiah of the Jews and he ordered the Jews uh, to um, blaspheme the Torah. That's putting it mildly. Uh, what he decided was that debauchery was theology. Uh, that every word of the Torah is true in the opposite sense. That means 613 mitzvot were all sins. And all the sins became mitzvot. And, well, let, let's take a simple example. Do not kill became do kill. Do not adulter became do adulter. Uh, Purim was his, his favorite holiday. That was the annual wife swappers holiday. Uh, it was called Extinguishing the Light. And by, by his order, the Jews swapped wives. All over the world, this was not a local phenomenon. Now, all the, the books say the same thing, that uh, Shabtai Tzvi gained um, prominence from Iran to Mexico. All over the world, the Messiah was going to come, and he announced the date. And this date, by the way, is significant because it shows he had uh, Christian uh, backers, uh, theologians behind him. He declared he was the Messiah on June 18th of 1666. Uh, June, of course, is the sixth month. 18 is uh, six times three, and we don't have to uh, but 666 is obvious enough. And on that day, the, all of a sudden, it was the time of redemption. And the Jews could do anything they wanted. You know his, his prayer, um, the, the prayer that the Jews quoted, were blessed be he who permits the forbidden. That was the actual Sabbatean prayer. And the Jews went through an orgy worldwide. Of, uh, again, the Christians would call it Satanism. Uh, but it was certainly, certainly, uh, he changed Judaism in the worst possible way. Now, I'm not sure if you understand that Shabbat Svi did not die. Now, this is the, the real issue and the real problem, is that uh, the Sultan of Turkey said enough of Shabtai Tzvi. Uh, this was in September of 1666. He, all over the world, they were coming to his court. Go and look up Shabtai Tzvi in a book of Jewish history. Where did he go? <laughs> he was the most influential rabbi, the most influential rabbi um, in modern times. And he has been rubbed out of the history books. Keep that in mind. You can't find that much in Shabtai Tzvi. But the Sultan of Turkey said enough. You have to convert to Islam. And Shabtai Tzvi, now there are conflicting reports, but he apparently without any resistance uh, took off his kippah and put on a, a turban and the next thing you know he was a Muslim. And most Jews worldwide abandoned Shabtai Tzvi, and they were very, very upset. You know, you have to realize what they did uh, leading up to the day that he announced he was the Messiah. They, they stripped their houses of roofs because they thought they were going to be transported magically to Jerusalem. They buried themselves up to their necks in, this was, uh, you know, in, 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 in Europe leading up to June, it's awfully cold be buried in the ground, uh, uh, getting punishment, they would flagellate, they would throw themselves into the Mediterranean, the icy waters. The Jews went nuts. Worldwide, they went nuts. And that's what's happening to Israel today. Israel is going nuts. And, and I, I'm trying to explain where it's coming from. And the Israelis just think, darn, we got the worst leaders anywhere. 
They just lie. They don't stop lying. You can't trust them. But Israel is going nuts. And you're going to see slowly how this came to be. Uh, call it a, an alternative uh, retelling of Jewish history because it really is. When Shabbat Tzvi converted to Islam, most Jews abandoned, but not all. There was a sect in Turkey called the Dana who decided that this was, in fact, a magical pronouncement by Shabbat Tzvi that we should all convert to other religions, but secretly practice Sabbatianism. Turkey is run by the Sabbateans, and we'll get to that shortly. But uh, what, what can I say? Jacob Frank. Jacob Frank was Europe's second messiah. That's what he was called. The second messiah of the Jew was Jacob Frank. And he worked from about 1750, died in 1791, born in 1726. Yeah, those are about the, the right dates. What he did was he convinced the bishop of, um, of his diocese that his people were not Jews, they were anti-Talmudists. And the bishop fought it. And he ordered all the Talmuds uh, of the dice uh, uh, burnt. And then he said, I'll bring you lots and lots of new Catholics. He brought them 5,000 to be mass converted to Catholicism. I believe the year was 1759. All of a sudden, Europe's Jews, by the many thousands, were becoming Catholic publicly. They despised Catholicism, but in privately, they were Sabbatean. And as fantastic as it seems, there really, really are conspiracies of silence. If the rules are you don't open your mouth, you don't open your mouth, they exist. The Sabbateans didn't just exist as a tiny little cult. They were being converted by the thousands in the 18th century. Oh, by the way, just to let you know about Jacob Frank and what it was uh, to be a Jew, it wasn't all just clandestine cells and subterfuge. You got so much fun. The purification of the soul was sex orgies. Frank expanded uh, Shabtai Svi. Now it's history. He's a big boy. What am I going to say? I can't. The purification of the soul was very anti-Jewish. It was a very bad thing <laughs> there to qualify this. He expanded Shabtai Svi into, into really a cult. And it was no different than a cult today where you control the minds of people through sex. Just leave it at that. Okay, and last word I say on it. Now, something happened. Oh, and by the way, I want to add something before I forget it. This is like an off-the-cuff lecture. The first Zionists. Last word on wife swapping that stuff. Last word. The first Zionists and their people seeing that's all it was. Without going into without going into the depths of who Golda Meir was and what her early life was and this and that that's what the first Zionists were. They were Sabbatean. I'm leading to that. They actually were Sabbatean, and they participated in this stuff. They used the word secular. That's the word they used. They were seculars. This is beyond secular. Secular to me is. Uh, not being affiliated with any religious group. This is beyond that, but they were called secular. Chiloni, in the Hebrew from the Greek Hellenistic, is what they called themselves, and they were proud of it. And their goal was to turn Israelis into Chiloni. They hated the religious. <laughs> let, let me not kid you how much the labor Zionists hated the religious. But let's go into our little story how it got that. Jacob Frank ran out of money in the year 1785 or so. This is when the Sabbateans made, well, a pact with the big devils. Suddenly, Jacob Frank got very rich in 1786. He moved his sect to Offenbach, uh, a suburb of Frankfurt. Frankfurt was also 
the home of Mayor Amschel Rothschild, and the home of someone named Adam Weishaupt. Little by little, this, for those unacquainted with this piece of history, the Rothschilds are the Sabbateans of the world, and here is why. There was a meeting that took place apparently in Rothschild's humble home then, in 1786, he was not all that wealthy. He was a, a coin dealer. His sons made him wealthy. His five sons uh, expanded a business. The business was to control the economies of nations and thus control the nations. He found a, magnif a magnificent formula. If we can get hold of the nations, economies, we've got the nations. He sat with Jacob Frank, who wanted the Jews to become non-Jews. He wanted them to become Sabbateans. He wanted them to accept the real Messiah of the Jews, Shabtai Tzvi, and incidentally, and the second Messiah, Jacob Frank. That's one of this little three-pointed triangle. That's one point. Adam Weishaupt was the founder of something called the Illuminati. What they did quite simply, was they had to overturn the existing societies. And unfortunately for us Jews, they did a real job. Now let me tell you uh, um, um, that all of this was banned. Now the story in all the history books is the same thing. That there was, uh, just before the French Revolution, a horseman fell. In his satchel were the plans for the revolution. In the satchel were the plans for the Illuminati and so forth. It was all banned. Throughout Europe, it was banned. And that put Weishaupt, that put Rothschild, and to a lesser degree, Frank, into a problem. What do you do if you're banned? And they came up with something that has changed history for good. Weishaupt said, well, what we do is we take our tenants and we put them into an organization that has lodges and chapters worldwide, and we subvert the existing organization to our tenants. And the organization they chose was British Freemasonry. Now, there was no such thing as a Freemasonic uh, conspiracy before the 18th century. As far as I can tell, they were very nice. They were a builder's guild. They, they uh, backed builders throughout Europe, and they were all right. All of a sudden, there are revolutions. All of a sudden, you have something you never saw before, ever. You actually saw talk of one organization upending whole nations. Now, here's where the Jews fit in, and this is the scary part. You now have a new world. Germany is Sabbateanism. That is where it began. Turkey is the Don. That's the home of Shabtai Tzvi. It's a major player, but it's now being shifted. The real players from here on in were Germany first, and then London, where there was freedom uh, to expand on their ideas. They moved from Germany to London, from London their ideas spread all over the world. In America, Solomon Schechter, the reform movement, it's all the same. Germany to London where it spreads to America. All of this, all of a sudden, the Jews have gotten an enlightenment. Moses Mendelssohn, he wasn't a Jew. He was born a Jew, but he converted. And his children converted all for the enlightenment of the Jews. One after another, the Jews were being diluted. They were being whittled down. By the way, the situation that I've seen in America is that worked like a charm. I'm telling you, you want to talk about whittled down Jews. Uh, this country is uh, really, really, except for the Orthodox, really lost its uh, Jewish thinking and heritage and that again, Germany, Solomon Schiff, to London. He gets the money, he gets the packing, he goes to America. Now we've got the world's greatest 
And this scares Jews. Believe me, I'm not blind to this. Uh, I'm very aware of this. There's a new history. It's not a new history. It's an old history being retold. But you have to look, and you can't ignore a really serious problem is that the Rothschilds took on America. And all of the following names are simply not Jewish. Within one generation, they stopped being Jewish. But from Frankfurt, Germany, the Rothschilds sent John Jacob Astor, Jacob Schiff, Max Warburg. He sent all of his agents to America to corrupt the robber barons, essentially. If you were very, very successful, they made a deal with you. You promote our thinking, and our thinking is the end of Jews. It really, really was a war against the Jews in a very different way that people understand. And it becomes harsh from your end. We're now in the 19th century, and that was not a good century for the Jews. That was the century of the pogroms. What you have now with America is try and find a Jewish Astor anymore. Try and find a Jewish ship. John Jacob Schiff's grandson is married to Al Gore's daughter. This is true blue Sabbatianism. We'll, we'll get to that. It's all over the place. It, it's terrifying. And, and we'll get to that. They're not Jews anymore, but they are affecting Jews. They want Jews to be something else. Now you've got, this is the, I find this a terrifying thing. You've got the Rockefellers, the Morgans, the Carnegies, the Harrimans. They were all given European money. America was not all that rich in the 19th century. You had people building railroads, you had them putting up steel mills, but the money was in Europe. And it was in the hands largely of the Rothschilds. Uh, of the Rothschilds. They agreed for ideological purposes that if you play our game, we'll give you power you've never had before. And this is how non-Jews started doing the work of the Sabbateans. And I have to be very, very easy on this. Very easy on this. The fact of the matter is in the 1870s, the Sabbateans of England decided on something new. The, the Jews weren't cooperating. They were not changing their point of view. They were not accepting Shabtai speed. They liked their religion. And I got to remind you of something very important. Until the rise of Sabbateanism, secretly, the Jews loved being Jews. It was as natural as breathing. There were no self-hating Jews. After Sabbatianism hit, the Jews started despising themselves. This was also done on purpose. But the point is in Britain, something called the British Israelites emerged. They actually thought that the British were Israelites. And I've read their stuff, it's weird stuff that in the Roman times, the tribe of Dan landed in England, and the London is named from the Dan, the tribe of Dan, and I've read their stuff. And uh, it's wacky, but nonetheless, they figured out the ultimate plan to get the Jews to be Sabbateans. They're gonna take back Israel, they developed Zionism. In the 1870s, they developed a perfect plan to get the Jews back to where they wanted the Jews to be. They developed Zionism. And the idea was to make life so miserable for the Jews of Europe that they would come to Eretz Israel. The Jews did escape Europe, but they went to America. That was the problem. Two million of them escaped Europe due to the pogroms. My, grandparent, my grandparents included, but they did not go to Eretz Israel. The first Aliyah was in 1880. A few went to Eretz Israel. The Rothschilds built Rishon and Zion. They built the first city in Israel. They, they, they got the ball rolling, but it was a lousy place to go. There was nothing there. There were a bunch of bandits and a bunch of malaria. 
and it just was not a good place to settle. So now I'm going to jump ahead before jumping back. Eventually this was solved by someone named Colonel Edward House. He was Woodrow Wilson's, well he was Woodrow Wilson. What he did is put restrictions on him, grave restrictions on immigration to the United States and the Jews no longer had that option after 19, 1919, I believe. But let's go to this real problem, and here is Zionism now. Folks, this is going to probably be a little shocking. In 1898, Theodor Herzl met Kaiser Wilhelm in Jerusalem. Now, if you think that Jerusalem was a good place to go on a holiday, in 1898, you, you don't know how bad it really was. Jerusalem, in fact, was a rocky place. There were no roads. You took a, well, the Kaiser didn't take a tram steamer. Everyone else did. You went up skinny little roads. There were no hotels. It was disease-ridden. You couldn't get a decent meal. And yet the most powerful leader of Europe came to Israel to put up three churches, one a very big church, the Church of the, the Dormition Abbey, the Church of the Dormition. On November 2nd of 1898, in Jerusalem, he met the father of Zionism, Theodore Herzl. Why would Herzl make that awful trip to Jerusalem to meet Kaiser Wilhelm? There was only one answer. He wanted a state. That's the only answer. And if you go on the internet, because this has been the most important meeting in, of modern Zionism, Herzl meets the Kaiser of Germany in Jerusalem, try and find it on the internet. It's been rubbed out, and the, the few sources that I got said all the same thing, Herzl was rebuffed. Rebuffed from what? What did the Kaiser do to rebuff Hetzel? And the answer is, he said, no, you're not going to get a state. We are not going to go to war with Turkey and give you a Jewish state because we have made an alliance with Turkey. And they permitted us to put up a church on the highest point in Jerusalem. I have a picture of it. Afterwards, take a look at the Dermission Abbey. And you'll see that Germany and Turkey formed an alliance. And Theodor Herzl changed. In 1901, Theodor Herzl met the British Zionists, who wanted Britain, not Germany, to get the Jewish state. And Theodor Herzl said, forget it. We cannot have a state in the ancient land of Israel. We would have to fight the Turkish-German alliance, it would kill millions upon millions of people. We can't do it, it's not worth it. They, he said to the British, you have land in Africa, just give us Uganda. It'll do, we'll live with it. And they, this would have ruined the Sabbatean plan. It would have destroyed the, the plan of the Sabbateans. The only way to get the Jews to become a different people was to have Eretz Israel back, not Uganda. Uganda wouldn't have done the trick. And anyways, we'd be Rhodesia today. You know, I mean, it, it wouldn't have worked anyways. So now here, and I warn you ahead of time, it's not easy speech, but nonetheless, I'm going to say it. You've now got a new leader of the Zionists. Now you have to, there was a little gap where someone named Wolfenson took over the World Zionist Organization, or what became known in Israel as the Jewish Agency. But then you got yourself a bad one. You got yourself a really, really dreadful, mass murdering head of the Jewish Agency, Chaim Weizmann. And when you got Weizmann in power, you got the Jews really in a lot of trouble. Now I'm gonna give you one example, and then just to make it easier, and then we'll go backwards. 1936, 
World Zionist Conference, Basel, Switzerland, Weizmann was applauded, no less, for saying, in the upcoming Holocaust, he used the word Holocaust, there may not be two million surviving Jews, but they will be strong and good for Eretz Israel. We're going to talk about the connivance very shortly of the labor Zionists with the Nazis. And it's not a nice story. Weizmann knew a Holocaust was coming. It was planned. And by the way, a third of my family died in the Holocaust. Um, I want you to know that. Thanks to my grandfather and me digging through old records and Yad Vashem and stuff, um, I, I, got, I found a, a third of my family were wiped out. So don't think I'm, uh, I'm not taking this personally. I'm taking this plenty personally. Folks, I'm going to test your maturity now. All right, and I'm not kidding when I say this. You are amongst the privileged who are going to hear this. Hein Weissman was a butcher. His name should be taken off every university and technical institution, everything. Wipe the name off. In 1908, a, a Sabbatean named Atartuk took over Turkey. And go on the internet and write a Tartuk Sabbatean, or a Tartuk Jew, and you are going to be very surprised how much Hebrew this man knew. He, the young Turks, the Donma, took over Turkey. Through their little Masonic lodges, Turkey was now taken over by the Sabbateans. Stage one done. Stage two, let's practice a Holocaust. They murdered a million and a half Armenians during World War I. This was a dry run for the big one. And today, by the way, I'm not going to go how the American Jewish leadership made darn sure the Jews of Europe just died, led by Rabbi Stuart Wise. And uh, I, can, I have a separate lecture on that mess, that not one Jewish organization, except the Orthodox rabbis, again, except for the Orthodox rabbis, not one Jewish organization tried to stop the Holocaust. Not a one. A third of my family, and I'm sure you have very similar stories. We have now got to this, I'm going to bring us up to date, and up to date, up to date. I'm gonna bring you to the year 1932. Skipping a lot of stuff, we'll just keep this on topic. In 1932, 250 plus organizations represented German Jewry, 250 plus. In 1934, one labor Zionist. All the rest were wiped out and only one was left, labor Zionist. Labor Zionism were allowed to keep camps to indoctrinate German Jewry into Sabbatianism before they would be shipped to Palestine. Practically all the Jews who came to Israel in the 30s were German. 70,000 of them. The reason why was the transfer agreement. Go on the, buy my book, it'll be dirt cheap. Otherwise go on the internet, look up the transfer agreement. What an agreement. And this was the end of Zev Jabotinsky and the Peru party as well. The transfer agreement stated, it was an agreement between the Jewish agency of Jerusalem and the Nazi party. And it was signed and it went, it went into effect. The Jewish agency would allow Germany to make life so miserable for the Jews that they would come to their indoctrination camps where the weak would be weeded out eventually to be killed in camps. And the strong would be sent to Israel. In return for which, the Jewish agency of Jerusalem would make sure that every immigrant used his funds to buy German goods, propping up the economy, would stop all protests, embargoes, anything against the Nazi regime. Worldwide, Jews in America were, were organizing parades against the Nazis. The word got out from the Zionists in Israel. 
Leave the Nazis alone. During the Holocaust, there was only one Jewish organization led by Chaim Weizmann who knew a Holocaust was coming, planned it with the Germans, and that was labor Zionism. Now, let, let me tell you something that's going to be shocking to you. And I, I, believe me, I believe that you are mature enough to accept this. It isn't easy for me. Do you think when I was researching this, I was, I was having a good time? I mean, I mean, you have to understand, this is crappy work. It's just something that fell into my hands. I wasn't even meant to do this work. You know, I was, until Rabin was murdered, I was the Israeli correspondent for The Hollywood Reporter and for Billboard magazine and Screen International. I was a trade journalist. Who, who even thought of this stuff? Now, with that in mind, that I was not looking for this, it just came to me. The idea of Israel was never to be a shelter for Jews. Never. No religious Jew was allowed in Israel all through the Holocaust. If he got in, it was through his doing. Nobody rescued any religious Jews. The only Jews allowed into Israel from 1933 until the white paper of 1939 were German Jews. Did you know Winston Churchill's mother was a Jew? And that means that Churchill himself was Jenny uh, Jacobson. Her father was a stockbroker from New York. Churchill was a Jew. He was a Sabbatarian. Look, look, again, you have to look this up on the internet who Jenny Jacobson was. Churchill was a Jew. He was another Benjamin Disraeli. It doesn't matter if they convert, to, the Sabbatians convert and they mix. It's a very ugly, messy situation. Stalin. You think Stalin was the Jew? All three of his wives were Jews. All his children are Jews. This is Sabbatianism. This was a Sabbatean war. I, you know, I, I'm not being overly dramatic when I say this either. This was a war fought by the Sabbatians, and they are not Jews. Don't mix them up. They are the enemies of the Jews. Israel took the German Jews and used them for seed stock to get a new Judaism. They were going to wipe out the Jews as many as they could of Europe and start a new Judaism in Israel based on Sabbatianism. The first president of Israel, Ben Svi, went to Turkey and became a true blue Sabbatean. Israel's founders were Sabbateans who went to Turkey to learn their stuff from the original Sabbateans. This is all true. It, 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 it's all true. Israel was the, the worst thing that ever happened to the Jewish people was labor Zionism. Now, in Marvin Antolin's book to eliminate the opiate, he calls the Holocaust as the Sabbateans call the Holocaust. Burnt offerings is the Sabbatean term for the killing of Jews. If you are a Jew who does not believe that Shabbat Svi was the Messiah, it is a mitzvah to kill you. They derive energy from this. This isn't properly understood, but it almost came out.